that we ignite people's imaginations. Gideon gets his men, and they chase these kings. Bill, what do you think? But it's so spiritual, it's so tender in his pocket, and he cannot realize it. I have a dream. Pacific Rim Bible College, equipping leaders for the 21st century church. Hello, I'm Wayne Cadero, and I want to welcome you to the Creative Biblical Communications class. Now, if you're a student, if you're an employer, an employee, if you're a staff member, or if you're a Sunday school teacher, this class is for you because it's our dedication, our commitment to building better communicators because it works for every area of your life. In fact, the success of your life will in great part be due to your ability or inability to communicate. You see, to have a concept or an idea on the inside is wonderful, but to be able to communicate it in such a way that people are persuaded, now that's divine. Communication is incredibly important in your marriage, in relationships, in ministry. It applies to every single person. Now, it's sort of like this. Someone once said, it's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to make sure that what you're speaking is truth, but it's your responsibility to make sure that it's interesting. And that's what we want to talk about. We want you to join with many others in this class as we learn about creative Bible communications. Now, this course is transferable. In other words, you can actually take this course as a leader and then be a moderator where this can go on a screen and other students, other people in your staff and your uh, area of embrace or your discipleship group can actually learn this course along with you, you as a moderator. So at this time, we want to welcome you to the class. Join with me and the many others as we learn about how to be better communicators. So take out a pen, some notebook paper, and here we go. Welcome. Good to see your bright, shining faces here early in the morning and your um, ready-to-go, hungry hearts. I tell people that uh, people of um, Packram Bible College should be PhDs if they're going to learn, and that is this. P stands for poor, H, hungry, D, desperate. <laughs> and that's the only way you're going to learn if you're PhDs. You're poor, hungry, and desperate. Otherwise, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. You're going to be overloaded with information. You're going to use none of it. You're going, to have, you're going to revel in the fact that you attended a class, not that you have learned anything from the class, nor are you different because of the class. And we don't want you to do that. You don't want to be a people who <clears throat> go through college, take a bunch of courses so that you can be called learned. You want to go through class so that you can learn. And if you want to be called learned, resign. If you want to learn, stay in and get your Ph.D., and you can get your PhD before you graduate. That's a heart set more than a diploma. And without that, you will not learn. So make sure that you're ready to go. Can you say amen? Yeah. All right. What you're about to learn is probably one of the most ancient skills known to mankind. The Greeks called it an orator. They would be people like Socrates and Plato. That, that would be a skill developed a skill necessary in order to lead, in order to entertain, in order to capture people's attention. Thanks, Kamu. It, it would be a skill that many would try to achieve and only a few did. They would actually, in oratory, be so concerned about their ability to articulate concepts well in front of people, to be able to think well, they would learn not only the mental part of it, which would be you've got to be a good thinker, if you're going to be a good speaker. You cannot be a poor thinker and think you're going to be a good speaker. Can't do that. You have to, you can do it for a while because you memorize like a song, you memorize a bunch of wordings and then you spill it out, that's nice. But if you're going to be what they call, and here's the word extemporaneous, extemporaneous, an extemporaneous speaker, that's a word that you wanna learn. Uh, every once in a while I'll give you a new word because you need to increase your vocabulary if you're going to speak. You cannot have eight words like, the kind, yeah, but the Arade, yeah, right, but we went. Well, who cares? 
you're going to have to increase your vocabulary from eight to a few more words. And so you're going to have to increase that by learning, by developing your skills, by being a better thinker. And they would go down not only to develop their thinking or to Mars Hill where they would discuss things or uh, up uh, to the Areopagus where they would discuss things about religion. And even though they weren't necessarily Christians, they were extremely religious people. They understood that there was something beyond what they could understand that empowered them, that made the world go around. So they called it mythological figures and they would put their human beliefs into stone form and then call them gods. Well, it's there that if you recall, Paul the Apostle in the book of Acts walks around and actually says, I see that you are a very religious people. You even have a stone god to one who is called the unknown god. This is the one that I have come to preach to you about, orate to you about, communicate to you. It was then that he began to meet with those and he could match mind for mind, ability, knowledge with those best on Mars Hill. If you're going to be a communicator in order, you need to know the ability to think or how to think. You increase your vocabulary. You are an extemporaneous speaker, which means you don't just memorize something. When you stand up to speak at a moment's notice, you're able to collect enough thoughts to give a pretty good oration or a theory or a philosophy or a concept or an idea. You're able to, be able, you're able to bring that forth so that people can follow you. So they would have on one hand the ability to think, to philosophize, to be able to think through concepts and ideas and then take imaginations and put them into a communicable form. This is the skill. This is the knowledge over here. This is the skill to be able to communicate that knowledge. You, ne you need to have both. They go in tandem. It's like a bicycle. You gotta have two pedals. If you have one, you can pedal, but it's gonna be, you're gonna be hard pressed to get anywhere. But if you've got two, you're able to do that. And that's the same, that's true with any type of oration. You're gonna have to be in tandem, the ability to think well, think deeply, and have some concepts that can change people's lives, and change the way they think, and change their perception of life. And then you're going to have to have the skill to be able to orate or communicate that. And we're going to be talking about both of them. So in the Greeks, they call it oratory. They would even, in developing the skill, this sounds kind of gross, but they would have the young students go down to the riverbed and take small pebbles and fill their mouth with pebbles till they had just had their teeth clenched. And then they would give a talk with their teeth together holding pebbles in their mouth. This would develop their ability to use their facial muscles so that you don't talk like this, you know, and uh, nothing moves but uh, just the inside. And so you've got to be able to move your mouth so that you can articulate so that people understand that it goes over a microphone. And by the time it gets to people's ears today, they got it. Well, in Grecian times, they didn't have microphones, so they had to speak very loudly to those that were in attendance, and they had to move their mouths and their lips and utilize facial muscles. All of that is part and parcel to communication. You have to learn all of that, and that's what this class is about. So I don't want you to come and just listen and say, okay, that's cool. I need you to practice it because Pacific Rim Bible College is a place where we're developing men and women for ministry, not those who just want to know a little bit more about religion. So this is uh, probably one of the most ancient skills of, known to mankind. The Romans called it eloquence. They would even take it to another level so that they would have eloquent speakers, people that were, would be political or diplomats or ambassadors in the democracy of Rome, and they would then orate, but they would do it eloquently. They would try to move the masses, as was, if you take a look at the Macedonians under Alexander the Greek, they would call these people the generals, those that had the ability with oration and eloquence and passion to move masses of armies with which they would hope one day to conquer the world. And so they would add passion to that. You could see it in the military form of the 
movie, uh, Braveheart, how Mel Gibson would go through and, and, and impassion, embolden, and flame the armies to even fight to their death. It was their final epitaph that they would, they would cry out, we are brave, we're ready, and they would be slaughtered. You'd see that in Shogun. You'd see that in many other military forms of films made today, how prior to a battle, there would be an eloquent orator who would communicate again the reason for the battle. And victory was not their goal. Bravery, standing up for their country, defending their beliefs even unto death, that was their goal. And victory, icing on the cake, but not necessarily always expected. So you will see that whether it's back to the Greeks, Romans, Macedonians, military uh, might even yet today, you will see the importance of communicating with passion, with knowledge, with skill with passion, with knowledge, with skill. You got those three? With passion, with knowledge, with skill. Now, although it's an ancient form of communication, this oratory with excellence, and by the way, what were those three things you had to mix into that as ingredients? It was, what was it again? Passion, that was one. Knowledge, knowledge yeah, and the other was? Skill. Yeah, skill, skill. And so, uh, as they would take this, they would be able to move masses of people in a certain direction. Now, not only is it something known to mankind as an ancient skill and a necessary art, but, you know, in the scriptures, it's one of the most important assignments given to us to proclaim the gospel with passion, with skill. Oh, what was the other one? Oh, yeah, knowledge. And so we want to talk about that today because each of you have been called to be preachers. Turn with me in your Bibles. By the way, bring your Bibles when you come to this class, <clears throat> because what we're going to be communicating is what's bound in that leather-bound book. That's what we're going to be talking about. Romans chapter 10. We have an interesting <clears throat> scripture that the, the Apostle Paul speaks about. Verse 13. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not yet believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not even heard about? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things or good news. However, they did not all heed the glad tidings, because they won't. For Isaiah says, the Lord, Lord, who has believed our report? But remember this, in the 17th verse, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. How will they hear unless there's a preacher, and how will you preach unless you're sent? That's what Pacific Rim Bible College is all about to train people who proclaim the word of God. No, 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 not give good talks. There's a lot of people behind pulpits that give good talks. But you know, the world doesn't need any more good talks. Now, I'm not saying it shouldn't be creative. I'm not saying you shouldn't be eloquent as possible. Apollos was a man who was mighty in the scriptures, the scripture says, which means he was eloquent. And so he was able to persuade, to move masses of people. You want to be able to do that. You want to be able to develop your gifts and your ability to move people because there is no greater vision. Every other vision pales in comparison to that of the Word of God and the Kingdom of God. So you're going to have a huge, wonderful privilege to preach the Word of God. So you want to do that eloquently. You want to do it with oratory. You want to do that with creativity. You want to spice it with humor. You want to be able to sprinkle it with anecdotes and illustrations. You want to do it well so that what you're talking about goes deep into the hearts of people, woven into the very fabric of their personality, and they're not just educated when you're done. They have received revelation. Big difference. When the Holy Spirit is able to take what you say and turn it into, convert it into, transition and transform it into revelation, 
Now you're making a difference in people's lives. So they don't need good talk. You know what they need? They need to have people say, thus saith the Lord. They need preachers who will be prophetic. And that's what we want you to be. To be able to not only train preachers, but send them. But not just people who give good talks. Now, you can give good talks and people go, woohoo. Turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You're in Romans, go to your right, 2 Timothy chapter 4. It's right after 1 Timothy to help you out here. All right. Let's look at about, uh, let's start at verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. Here it is. Preach the word. Be ready. This is the extemporaneous word. Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, preach God's word. Don't just give talks. And be ready to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with great patience and instruction. Listen to this, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. But you, you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. I want you to remember verse 3. For time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate. They'll accumulate for themselves teachers after their own desires. You don't want to be in that roll call. You want to make sure that even though people may reject you at times, because it's not always the most popular assignment among men today. When you're on an airplane and they say, what do you do? And you say, I'm a preacher. And they'll look at you like, oh... Good night. Okay. Let's find another seat. Because they think you're just about to just vomit on them random scriptures to let them know that you're learned. And yet you haven't learned anything. No, you hold in you the most precious message in the universe. And it's not to be just spouted randomly. You don't disrespect the gospel by just spouting it off. No. You speak it because God tells you to speak it. Then it's prophetic. If God don't tell you to speak it, don't speak it. There's times on the airplane I try to hide what I do until they finally, finally push and press. You write books, yeah, about what? A leadership. Well, what kind of leadership? You really want to know? Yeah. You really do, yeah. Spiritual leadership. Really? Yeah. Without spiritual leadership, the world will never be changed because you can have leaders like Hitler, you can have leaders like Idi Amin, you can have leaders like Saddam Hussein. Leadership alone can be devastating and volatile. It's spiritual leadership that leads men into God's best. Mm, tell me more. You see, if I tell them right at the beginning I'm a preacher, it doesn't have real high ratings because of the abuse that preachers have given to that name of preaching because we're out to give good talks or we're out to vomit scriptures at random, disconnected. You don't want to do that. People are not tired of the gospel. People are tired of tired presentations of the gospel. Can you remember that? Now, as I speak, you're going to listen, but I want you to take notes. Because if you're waiting for something profound, you just missed it. People are not tired of the gospel. They're tired of tired presentations of the gospel. And we want to change that. Because the, the, the Word of God, the Scriptures of the power of God unto salvation, both to the Jews and to the Greeks, barbarians, Scythians, slaves, and freemen. It is the power of God unto salvation. And you've been entrusted with the gospel. So it's one of the most important assignments given to us in the scriptures to be proclaimers. Talkers? No, proclaimers. Of what? Interesting facts? No, you may use interesting facts and you'll use human interest stories, but it is only to give context to the truths of the Word of God which changes a man and a woman's soul. So it's one of the most important assignments given to mankind. The oldest skill, most ancient, known to man, most important given by the Lord to those of us who are here to be preachers who will proclaim the good news, not just give talks. 
Otherwise, we'll tickle people's ears and that's all we'll go for. Now, you need to be prophetic. You need to be able to, when you talk, to say, thus saith the Lord. I tell people when I'm done on a Sunday, I get off of the pulpit and I need to be able to, I don't worry if nobody, if no one says, good job, doesn't bother me at all. I need to be able to get off of that podium, step to the side and simply say this, Jesus, I said what you asked me to say and that's good enough. Now, then, part B is, I could have said it better. I could have used a better illustration. I could have uh, prompted the people more, gave, given them better context. I could have used a, a funnier story. I could have done all kinds of things differently. And I'll work on that. But the bottom line is, you better be able to say, I said what you asked me to say for this moment in time, and that's good enough. Now, I'll be better at it as far as the skill and putting the rocks in my mouth and, and uh, using my facial muscles a little bit better and articulating my words and using better vocabulary and illustrations that hit home. But in the end, if that's all you have, you're in trouble. But if you can step down off of that podium and say, say, Jesus, I said what you asked me to say, then the Lord will say, good, I'll help you with the skill part. But you stay true to the obedience part. Otherwise, you'll be those that, that uh, tickle people's ears and the churches are full of them. That's why we have 379,000 churches in the U.S. today. We spent over $70 billion, billion dollars in church conferences and seminars last year. Yet our prisons are overflowing, our families are falling apart, and there's an apostasy in the churches where we're becoming so liberal that we have matched our faith to our lifestyle rather than our lifestyle to our faith. That's a choice you'll have to make. By the way, this weekend I'll be speaking on that, getting beyond good intentions. And one of the things is you're going to have to decide one day now or one day later whether you're going to match your lifestyle to what you believe or you're going to match what you believe to the way you want to live. And the world is full of that, where people are now making their, their theology match their lifestyle. And they've, di they've diluted the churches. You need to be prophetic. Otherwise, in Jeremiah, do you remember the false prophets or the false preachers that in Jeremiah would be proclaiming, peace, peace, says Jeremiah, and there is no peace. What were they trying to do? Tickle the ears of the believers so that we're saying what they want to hear, that will touch their emotions and give them a little laughter, or make them tear up, and we use wonderful little uh, touch points and, and little tipping points and punch and push a little button here and there, and it makes everybody, whoo, what a great talk. But we're not there just to have people have the feel goods. You want them to feel good, but that's not your goal. You gotta work hard to keep the good news good news, because you don't want it to become bad news. So I'm not saying just be a, just become a condemning, condescending preacher. No, 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 no. You got to work really hard to keep the good news, good news. So that's the skill part. But you don't want to just give good talks because people have to go away saying the truth has resounded in my heart and I will live differently today because of what I've just heard because it came through a preacher, but it came from the throne of God. So it's not only the most ancient of all skills, oratory, eloquence, charismatic movement of mil militia and armies to a certain cause or crusade, but it's also one of the greatest assignments given to mankind by the Lord. And you are some that at least are wrestling with the fact that maybe God is calling you to be one of them. And that's why you're here in this class. And my prayer is when it's done, at least you know what this entails so that you'll know even more clearly as to whether or not you have been assigned by God to be one of these called the proclaimers of the gospel, the preacher of the good news, the prophetic voice to a world that's desperate. Now, so you say, well, how do you do all of this, Wayne? What, where do you start? <clears throat> Number one, would you write down, I'm going to give you how to build this kind of heart. And let me give you three things. Number one, now this is going to sound redundant, and I might even be talking to the choir. 
But number one, if you're not doing daily devotions and if you don't want to do it, get out of the class because you're not giving good talks. You're preaching the Word of God. And if you don't know the Word of God, you don't want to preach. If you're going to be a mechanic, you better know something about mechanics. If you're going to do surgery, you better know stuff about the anatomy of mankind. If you're going to fix computers, you better know what? Computers. If you're going to fix radios, you better know a lot about what, Ben? Radios. That's right. If you want to do web, Phil, you better know something about the internet. The internet. Yeah. You better know it. And if you're going to preach the Word of God, you better know the, the Word of God. Backwards and forwards. You need to know the heart of God. You need to know Him like nobody else knows Him. You're going to have to have an insight into the ways of God, not just the acts of God. You're going to have to have experienced the hand of God on your life, and you're going to have to be able to share and articulate how it felt when the hand of God was removed from your life. You will go through much suffering. Do you remember on the road to Damascus when the Lord knocked Paul, at that time Saul, off his high horse? And Ananias was told by God to go pray for him because he was now blinded. Ananias said, I don't want to pray for Saul. He's a Pharisee. He's been killing our kind. And I'm going to go pray for him? A negatory. And the Lord said, no, 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 you go pray for him. Listen to this. For he is a chosen vessel of mine, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Did you know that if you're going to be a preacher, you're going to suffer? Because you're going to have to articulate what it means in the midst of suffering, how to, as 1 Peter 4.19 says, and to those also who suffer according to the will of God and trust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Do you know that there's going to be a way that you can suffer that's according to the will of God and there's a way that you can suffer that's not according to the will of God? But you will suffer. Because if you're going to be a preacher of substance and a preacher of credibility and a preacher of example and a preacher of reality, you will suffer. So do not think that, oh, now that I'm going to accept God's call, everything's going to be peaches and creams. You're, you're far off the mark. You're going to go through valleys. You're going to go through dark times. You're going to go through everything that other people will go through. At least the same emotional pang. You won't go through the same exact experience, but you will have the same struggle, hurt, and pain. It may be the loss of a child. Jonathan Goforth was a great preacher along with Hudson Taylor in the Inland China mission during the Boxer Rebellion when they were throwing all of the foreigners out of China. Jonathan Goforth was a great man of God, and I would encourage you to read some missionary biographies, by the way, so that you will see how they lived. One was Hudson Taylor. You want to read about him. Another is Jonathan Goforth. Another is David Livingstone. Another is George Mueller. Another would be uh, Jim Elliott of the Aka Indians. Uh, a film has been made about him recently called The End of the Spear. It uh, talks more about Nate Saint and uh, his son, but, uh, and Steve Saint, but uh, Jim Elliott was the one who was really the igniter, the spark plug behind all of that. But you want to read some of those missionary biographies and it will help you immensely. But Jonathan Goforth, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, as I recall from his story, but four of his children died in China while he was a missionary there. Four. Some from tuberculosis, others from other diseases. One just fell off the top balcony and saw his child die. And yet he remained in China because of a call. Do you think he suffered? Four of your children. Do you think he wondered, should I be here? Is this a curse of God? Have I missed the will of God by coming here to China? Because now I have four of my kids dead. Wouldn't you wonder that? And I wonder how many of us would leave. But for him, he said, no, no, I'm okay. Towards the end of his life, he went 